For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. Welcome to His House of Learning. This is your host, Christian M.C. Fulmer. The members of Mystery Babylon. Long time coming. Now we'll be addressing Buddhism. It's titled Humane Self-Annihilation. There's a few other t working titles for this for this talk of the series, but really after a certain amount of time, time longer than most of my <laughs> what I think I'll spend spend on most of these, it came to my attention that really. It's strange, I wanted to classify as a form of nihilism, but properly so, it doesn't fall into that category. So, what is Buddhism? Well, before we get on to the rest, the slides, it's a Eastern phenomenon. It seems to be that turn of the 6th century, there was quite an explosion of different forms of philosophy and spirituality in the Western and Eastern world. Because around this time, as well, you have that of the number of Chinese philosophies, including that of uh, Confucius, and also that of the Greeks, start to become more prominent as well. So, interesting century indeed. Now, Buddhism supersedes Hinduism by a number of centuries. Although, although it is undeniable and that its linkage is directly to that of the Vedic tradition, and yet there is a tear between the two, and the, but nonetheless, what I would say when it comes down to it, I would say that in the grand scheme of things, Hinduism would be more of the dark occult, the dark magic, the, the black magician, if you will. And Buddhism is more of the white magic, the light side of the force, the white magician, if, if you will. And my big concern is, it seems that, more often than not, Westerners, particularly of the faith, that is, in that of our Lord Savior Jesus Christ, and I'm speaking at large, tend to be more mindful of Hinduism, but tend to be much more congenial with Buddhism. And yet, they are different means, but very much to a distinct end, because if you remember back to the talk on Hinduism, self-annihilation, self-extinction, was likewise the end game of what it means to exist. Turn our attention over to a little bit of history. But before we get into the graphic details, the big, the big uh, theme of this for the Buddhists is wisdom. Let's see here. What does Job have to say about wisdom? What has the Lord God put into the heart of Job? A man who, like Prince Siddhartha, Gwatma, Buddha, later the, the Buddha, would, go, would, ex, would experience a considerable amount of pain, anguish, suffering, and just uncertainty. And yet, unlike Siddhartha, Job was set upon a rock. Siddhartha was just awash in the waves of time and space. And he had no choice but to look inward. Whereas for Job, he was able to look outward, into the heavens, which did not stare back at him indifferently, 
or even worse yet, <laughs> with apathy. But instead, with a desire to be a heavenly father. Let's look at what Job has to say in Job chapter 28, verses 20 through 28. It states, Whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living, and kept close from the fowls of the air. Destruction and death say, We have heard the fame thereof with our ears. Destruction and death say, We have heard the fame thereof with our ears. So, neither, so destruction and death have heard of wisdom, but that's it. Important to keep in mind regards to this form of Eastern mysticism. Verse 23 onward, God understandeth the way thereof, and he knoweth the place thereof. For he looketh to the ends of the earth, and seeth under the whole heaven, to make the weight for the winds, and he weigheth the waters by measure. When he made a decree for the rain, and way for the lightning of the thunder, then did he see it, and declare it. He prepared it, yea, and searched it out. And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Fear of the Lord is wisdom, and to depart, to turn from evil, is understanding. Keep that in mind as we explore what, the, what Buddhism sees as wisdom. A false light, a mere refraction of darkness. So, Prince Siddhartha, as you probably already read, bore along the border of modern Nepal and India mid, that's right, we use BC and AD in this house, 500 be before Christ. Of a royal caste, he was raised to be an emperor of the world. That was, and bear in mind, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha is more legend than history, although. I'm convinced that there was such a man. The details, though, waffle. Unlike, unlike Jesus Christ, he didn't have followers who <laughs> wrote down his endeavors, his accomplishments, his triumphs during their lifetime. Of a royal caste, he was raised to be an emperor of the world. That was one of the prophecies foretold about him. The thing is, though, he forsook fortune and family Acknowledging inevitable, inevitable suffering. He wandered, begging and meditating according to Vedic tra tradition. And this was after... As he was, uh, he was truly sheltered <laughs> for much of his life into his adulthood. And finally he came across a poor man, an old man, poor, slow, well, let's face it, old sick, poor, and also dead. Poor, old, sick, and dead people. And dawned on him, oh, because he was hidden from mortality. Oh, so, event so eventually I will too will suffer, and so will everybody else, and I'll be the end of it. So begin begging and meditating according to the Vedic tradition, so remember, this is in India, so he's trying to India or Nepal, depending on the stories, but he is trying to figure out, well, wh what of it? The thing though is that he was convinced the rituals of the Brahmins, remember the esoteric high priests, and the highest grade of the caste, or for you English, English folk, caste system, were empty of wisdom. Continuing, so upon becoming the Buddha, he was, in, he was inheriting millennia lives past as a bodhisattva, a being seeking enlightenment slash awakening, developing to a more perfect state. So, so really, is that he was going to, is that he was the, technically the first Buddha of this universe, because 
here's the thing about interesting about well interesting not interesting however you want to see it thing about buddhism is that it does to a degree not directly but it can be inferred strongly inferred that it lends itself greatly to string theory which is why it's one of the reasons one of the reasons why it's not seen as so hostile to our godless scientific community because in this case in this but in this case in this lifetime for him even though he's the, technically the first buddha of our world he is inheriting many millennialized past because remember it's not just in, in other words of uh, for eastern mysticism in this in this tradition souls of a person transmigrate but as do un universes so universes come you know comes to be spontaneously eventually the law of entropy takes them down to nothing they self-destruct implode wherever it may be and then they're essentially brought back again so like i said that's how it lends itself greatly to uh string theory to the multiverse which is uh, definitely one of the greatest distractions and scientific quote unquote scientific fiction theories ever conceived out of sheer, out of sheer desperation of which to this is just just rob the reality of eternity along with that of that of uh that of paradise in resurrection or damnation due to due to uh, due, due to the uh, righteous wrath and judgment of the lord god so yeah so enlightened awakening delve into a more perfect state so hence you have that element of evolution as well he chose consciousness over karma bliss in absence of senses there's still a degree of karma in buddhism but the key thing is consciousness and the, and the thing is about this transcending consciousness we're getting more into that later and bliss in the absence of senses so bliss so you're not experiencing contentment if you will through your five senses it's complete it's completely uh well it's not even spiritual for that matter that's the term bliss it's probably one of the closest things we can use of course there are terms of which we can use but like I said, more of that will be explained. Now, prior reaching achieving enlightenment, he endured the seductions of Mara, a spirit being of war and desire. And if you remember Taoism, which perhaps I should do something on that, it's one of the lesser known Eastern uh, tra tra uh, traditions. You have that the yin and yang, light and the dark, order and chaos but they're not antagonistic to each other they are part of the cosmos they're part of the of a universal consciousness except the highest stance of that consciousness is in well the bliss the nirvana itself as well so mara is not evil he may be defined sign or label as evil in a number of publications but nonetheless remember the view of good and evil in eastern mysticism is far different than that of much of other eastern traditions western for sure to a large degree of that of scripture so he's a spear being a war and desire but bear in mind that's worth thinking about eastern mysticism particularly buddhism buddhism more than hinduism to give hinduism some some credit Buddhism is more of a transcendence of good and evil, more relativistic in that sense. Now, as he attained, it said that he attained higher stages of of jhana under the Bodhi, the awakening tree, where he entered a state of nirvana, bliss beyond death. Bliss beyond death, because remember, the goal, just like Hindus, the goal is to break the cycle of transmigration, to not reincarnate because to reincarnate means to go back into the world and the world is a problem because well we're going to explore more of this but bear in mind these are important things to take into consideration the physical the material world is in essence unnecessary it's an illusion it's very similar to narcissism 
in that really you're trying to just no longer be a part of this physical world whereas in scripture being human involves having a body living involves being in a physical world in fact even in the book of revelation there's a new heaven and a new earth the material world is not going anywhere it is essential for even the future of the resurrected I mean, even christ as a reminder he has a body that still bears the scars in his wrists, his feet, and his side. So keep that in mind. So whereas Christ indeed shows that suffering, that death can be overcome, so glory God and by the grace of his sacrifice, the Buddha decided, well, it's best to just Oh, just no longer just no longer just deal with it very similar to the mindset of suicidal people because they don't because suicide people don't end their lives because well because it's fun it's because they just can't deal with the agonies of living anymore and I pray for you if that's the case for you. Read the book of Job. Pray to the Lord for comfort and guidance. I promise you, you will receive it. Four Noble Truths. So, upon his, his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, and then he would continue to live as stories, as the legends go, into his early 80s, or some 80s in general. Let's go with 80s. That's That seems to be the common uh, denominator. There are four noble truths. Understand the dukkha, suffering. And this suffering entails any pain, change. Change. And imperfection. Understand that there is dukkha, that there's suffering, that there's pain, change, and imperfection. The second truth one needs to realize, according to, to uh, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, is to, that you need to abandon sumudaya, the cause of suffering, in sensual craving. So remember, the, remember your five senses. So it's not just, don't just think in terms of, you know, love of money and, and sensuality, sexuality. No, it's just really just the craving, just desire, just to just a want through any of your senses. Three, experience the naroda, the cessation of craving, which is equal to nirvana. It's short term. So bear in mind, these four... Steps are things that are done over the course, depending on who you are, because especially based on your past lives. Because if you are, because if you are reincarnated from that of previous enlightened in individuals, then you'll achieve these stages faster in your current life. Otherwise, it's going to take longer. So it can be anywhere from months to decades where this takes place. And then after you experience the cessation of craving, sense that bliss, apart from your senses, that's a short period of nirvana, you need to develop, cultivate the maga, the path to cessation. And that's maga, M-A-G-G-A. -G -G the path to cessation. So in other words, now that you've experience that you need to duplicate it time and time again which is why buddhists will spend just a monumentous hours and days out of days some in weeks others months years at a time in meditative ritual and ceremonial practices and remember the objective is permanent cessation Ending the cycle of transmigration, 
as in not re as in not reincarnating, to be extinguished in enlightened gnosis. Remember, gnosis is secret knowledge. To be extinguished in enlightened gnosis. So that's what wisdom is supposed to do. It's supposed to remove you from physical existence, heck, not even spiritual existence. You're not alive, you're, you're not dead, you're just somewhere and nowhere. All right. Those are the four truths to consider, and then there's the Eightfold Path. And the Eightfold Path, once again, is a very underestimated summary. Because if you think the Bible is long, well, you should see the, uh, not just the literature, bear in mind, not just the literature, but as well as a number of the practices, rituals, and ceremonies, of which... You know, instructions are rather short, but it's the repetition and the duration of the time and energy, not resources, that's be put into these as well. So, a full path, one must have the right view. And part of that, with the meditation initially, is to clear, empty your mind. Essentially, receive, you know, remove all preconceived notions of essentially anything. Thereby, once you've cleared your mind of really, essentially, really, just uh, just just any inhibitions, other you know, other than giving into your you know, giving into a sensual desire of any kind, you have the right intention. Then you have to have the right speech, temperance temperance, temperance to the nth degree. The right action, likewise reflecting the first three, the right livelihood, emphasizing all of the four, the right effort, and this is where you have to find that golden mean, that middle ground. Not too much, not too little. And this is, and keep in mind, this is heavily workspace trial and error. Achieving nirvana, achieving the cessation of craving, takes several lifetimes. There is no expectation that any single individual will get it right during that time. The, the, the Buddha is literally one out of a billion. And then the right mindfulness. And finally, right concentration. Right mindfulness concentration. We'll be exploring all, of, all eight of these in the upcoming traditions. And mindfulness is uh, actually a current phenomenon in the West. And really, the key thing about mind mindfulness, which applies that as well as right mindfulness means awareness without evaluation. So you're aware of everything around you of the options, the choices, of opportunities, especially that, that others choose. But the key thing is, because remember, you've emptied your mind, you've cleared, really, really, not just, not just your sense, not just your sense of self-awareness, but your sense of judgment, hence, without evaluation. So you're never to to, to weigh, to measure any choices or considerations in the moral sense. Some would argue with me that's not quite true, but... Well, read and ask for yourself. Read, ask, listen for yourself to those who practice, and you'll see that's the essential thing. And also applying to right mindfulness, it's known as sati, which is remembering to observe. So the key thing is observation. If you know anything about the scientific method, observation, hypothesis, experiment test, conclusion, and the knowledge, you know, whatever you learn, regardless whether or not your hypothesis is true. Well, when it comes to Buddhist meditation practice, observation is essentially 
That's it. Remember, hypothesizing means making an evaluation. Testing means seeing whether or not the evaluation, that evaluation is warranted. And there's no need to have a conclusion because, well, conclusions are irrelevant. We'll explore more of that soon. This form of meditation is applied to, bear in mind, psychiatry, education, healthcare, business, the military, public administration, nonprofits, and NGOs. Mindfulness. This is a Western. This is a Western uh, ad adaptation. Very similar. They say it's devoid of the spiritual aspects, but really, it's not. You'll find this in quite a few places. So if you ever hear or hear of anywhere, in fact, if you've been staying on, if you've been staying in, on top of on top of my uh, series of flourishing together, I reveal that Grand Canyon University and a number of other Christian universities, whether a part of the CCCU, the Coalition of Christian Colleges and Universities, or not, members, a part of their curriculums, particularly. In psychology, sometimes business, and large degree in education. When they mention meditation, they mean a long, they mean a form of mindfulness. So yes, while they're saying you can't read the Bible and pray or talk about the Lord, well, in the meantime, yeah. You're engaging in sati, remembering to observe. Awareness without evaluation. Keep that in mind. No pun intended. There are multiple tra Buddhist traditions, but these are the three largest ones. There's Mahayana Buddhism, known as the Greater Vehicle, the Way of the Many. This emerged in the first century AD during India's Gupta dynasty spread to China, Korea, Japan, Tibet, Indonesia, Nepal, and Vietnam. It deifies the Buddha, incorporating folk gods and goddesses. The pursuit of perfection, sorry, pursuit of, pursuit of perfect wisdom, prajna, to become a bod bodhisattva, an attainer of Buddhahood who denies nirvana to help others achieve it. So there's the compassion. Compassion is a, quite the prominent term in Buddhism. And the highest form of compassion is rather than entering into nir, nir, like nir, nirvana, if you achieve Buddhahood, you decide to reincarnate so you can continue teaching others for as long as, well, you can so help or, or uh, endure. So essentially, your compat. So essentially, think about this: perfect wisdom is becoming somebody who wants to help others achieve self annihilation. It's, it's uh, that's why I said humane, as in it's. So it's it's kind of an inverted mercy killing, if you will. I mean, I wish I wish I can speak more uh, tenderly, but really, I mean, that's the, I mean, the goal is for people to not live, to not exist anymore. So, as you can imagine, those who are very fond of the environment to the point where they want people to die in mass or just no longer live on the planet for the sake of Gaia, their Earth Goddess, Buddhism is very attractive in this case. So, United Nations. World Economic Forum, the World Council of Churches. Yeah, so that's why they have no... I mean, in fact, uh, we'll be learning about Zen Buddhism coming up. Zen Buddhism, Zen Buddhism is very much appreciated because it's more proactive. It tends to be a little more proactive compared to two of these first two I'm going to be showing you. But at the same, but but at the same time, it's... Uh, same time, it's still rather effeminate when it comes to, well, the value of a human being. So this is what, so, so the majority of Buddhists fall under this tradition, 
And many people would say that the Buddha never said to be worshipped as a god. Which is correct. When you look at the oldest writings pertaining to him, he never made that statement, never communicated it. And yet, though, and yet what you do find, that there is a general tolerance for practitioners to continue in to you know to continue in worship of the gods and goddesses since in essence they could be expressions of the greater consciousness of that of our cosmic world and if anything that's just a sign that those people are going to need to be reincarnated several more times to wean themselves off of that so if anything by once again inference it's okay to deify the buddha because as long as your as long as your succeeding lives are in line enough to realize that that's no longer necessary hence these other two traditions which are for the more initiated and enlightened you have a Theravada Bo Buddhism, which is the way of the elder, the lesser vehicle, way of the few. This emerged after the death of Emperor Ahsoka, quite a few generations after, after, the, after the, the Buddha. It spread to Burma, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, and Thailand. And rather than having a general contemporary life, you know, pre, you know, practitioners as a whole live a mon live a monastic lifestyle in pursuit of nirvana through abstract theology. So these are your scholars. These are these are you know these are the uh, these are the men who will meditate day and night. It is the oldest school of Buddhist thought with teachings ascribed to be from the Buddha or at least enlightened monks approved by him during his lifetime. And then you have Zen Buddhism, very, po very, very popular amongst Westerners, especially those of a, once again, of a more, of, of a more martial background. Because aside from China, it was prominent, it was popular, still is to a great degree, but declining in Japan. This is attributed to Bodhidharma. You can imagine they saw him as an enlightened one. The fifth or sixth century AD of China, founder of wall meditation. Fun fact, the story goes that Bodhidharma meditated for so long at the wall that his body began to essentially decompose from atrophy. I'll leave it at that. Like I said, so it's a, it sounds like sounds like an extreme tantric Hinduism, you know, Vedic med, uh, meditation. And then there's Isai and Dogen, respectively, respectively founded the Rinzai and Soto sects of Zen in Japan. So, and that's the thing. It took off, and, it's, and Zen is one of the f very few that's. Very few forms of Buddhism that can be practiced amongst the Japanese because Zen, once again, gives a lot. You know, once again, due to the precedent set by, by, by you know, Gautama Buddha, is fit for those who, well, are more of a more martial background or inclinations, and hence hope. And hence, there's hope that they, you know, that they'll reincarnate. And thereby join something, something, something more in line, such as the Theravada, tra you know, tra you know, tradition. In fact, I would say the Zen tend to be the most resigned to well <laughs> conclusions to the unknown. And there's the thing. There's prominent. There's the three key terms here. You have Bodhi, which which applies to Buddhism, Buddhism as a whole, but more so to Zen. There's Bodhi, an awakening of intuitive truth through meditation. So inwardly, and remember, this is this is for that those who no longer want to 
reside in and deal with the pain, the pain and suffering, and the anguish. Yeah, certainly the mortality, just the corruption, just the re just just the reality that that death draws everybody to a close. So if you have, so if you can't look outward, you're gonna look inward. So intuitive truth through meditation. Satori applies mostly to Zen, is the immediate realization that all things are one. So immediate realization. Oh look at that! I forgot an L. Good job with the typos. So immediate realization that all things are one. So keywords immediate. For all Buddhists, there's supposed to be a realization that all things are one. That there is no distinct substances or beings or objects. We're all part of this in this, you know, indifferent floating consciousness of sorts. That is the universe at large. But this is the immediate realization. So because of the intensity and complexity, and you know, what I'd share with the wall of med med you know, med you know, meditation, it comes strong. In fact, I think it's uh, according to, that's right, you have a DT Suzuki, he expressed it as this realization being the equivalent of the bottom of a barrel, a bucket, so any, so, so any container just rupturing, just bursting. So once again, upending, removing all that was in you and all that you knew and understood, just, just the complete emptying of the mind and, and sensations. Creating an essence, a clean slate so to speak. And another method of doing so is the koans. Questions, puzzles, without answers. So there so these are so these are riddles, questions, puzzles that are intended to be open ended and have no answer. No remember, no no conclusion, no result, no logic of what is or what is not. And this is for the conditioning the mind for tranquility, despite acknowledged ignorance and uncertainty. So really in the long term, you don't have to know, you don't have to understand, doesn't matter. So tell me, with that said, as I've described with all three of these, does this lean itself to transcending good and evil, relativizing right and wrong. I think it speaks for itself. Now before we get to mantras and mudras, let's go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 verses 1 through 13. And this is where this, you know, so before we go into spells, and gestures that go with magic, with the with with the occult, because the higher forms of Buddhism are steeped in sorcery, especially behind the closed doors, behind the, the you know the you know the walls of these societies. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to Thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desires truth in the, the, in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. 
hide thy face from my sins, and blot all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So, we have David expressing what? Transgression, violation of the law, the Lord's law, eternal law, perfect law, is iniquity, living a life of perversion, of evil, of sin. And the Lord is the Lord. It's the Lord God, through his mercy, his grace, his goodness, that we are made clean to do his good work, to live the purity of which he's given us. And that's the thing, to, in, to that's thereby to have the right sensations, to have righteous, as in joyous, and strong desires. Joyous and strong, righteous desires. And in turn, we teach the truth, the Lord, the Lord, not us, that we found ourselves, but the Lord put into our hearts. So we find what? That God, Lord, God Almighty does the transformative work from the outside. Why? Because he's not just mere whatever. He's the creator of heaven and earth, people. Mantras and mudras, repetitive esoteric spells and occult hand gestures. Now these mantras, Mantra to be more accurate pronunciations, my, my apologies, are during introspective meditation. Remember, you're not meditating on anything else outside, but only in. Fun fact, you're meditating on literally nothing. Even the Buddhists say that. When it's all said and done, you're meditating on nothing. So think about that. Meditating on what? In the grand scheme of things, nothing. I think so it's repetitive. And so you're, so, you're, so you're focusing on nothing in, in, in yourself. And these repetitive mantras, so these brief statements, are names of the Buddha, different names of the Buddha, different gods and spirits. Now why is that? Now why is that? Because remember, the why are God, and this is, even applies to to a, this even applies to Theravada and Zen Buddhism, by the way. Not as much as Mayana. Still to the other two. And later on we'll learn about Tibetan Buddhism. Why is that? Because remember, the Buddha was a reincarnated being from previous from previous Bodhisattvas. Many people who are more enlightened are those who came from previous enlightened individuals or near enlightened individuals and one of the one of the things that they figured out over time was it's wise quote quote wise to then engage in the meditation that those near enlightened if not enlightened individuals practiced and that included what repetitive mantras using the names, different names of Buddha, different gods, and spirits. There's also tantric deprivation of the mind. Remember, tantra is going to be something that's, uh, well, taboo, excessive. So, I mean, we're talking about high levels of fasting, putting yourself in very uncomfortable, if not, <laughs> not harmful you know, situations and environments. Nails, glass, cold heat, utter darkness, or even very high places that can induce, uh, <laughs> possibly induce vert vert you know, vertigo or just 
Or as you just, or you realize earlier, literally just staring at a wall inches away from from your face. And that's the thing: the higher types of these spells, so things, so ones that are known to have been performed by those who ascended to the higher levels of enlightenment, require initiation. So you have to be invited in to learn these mantras, and then. As for the hand gestures, they're motionless in position. And the best ones are the ones that are the most subtle. Because often because oftentimes you've seen, you know, just do the regular ones where they just hold their hands up off the side. I'm not gonna do any of them. Hold their hands up off the side. But there's also ones other ways as well in how you position your arms, your legs, your neck, or even periodically you'll move. And the more and some more subtle ones, where you're getting to a certain stance in mid motion, as well, usually holding for a second and then moving on. And that brief second or two is is the actual gesture in itself. So a lot of times it's even more. It's not just those, not just the, those that are those those that are held in held in your know, position. For, for long, it's also ones that are brief, and then there's also the channel of energy, and this is for to channel energy and or spirits, channel energy and or spirits. Once again, also practiced amongst those of the those of the more uh, those of even quote unquote less, those are less polytheistic, because they're still remember Buddhism at its core is pantheistic. So this energy or this and or the spirits are still a part of this greater consciousness, especially if they were an aid to the more enlightened, the more ascended masters. And once again, same thing, tantric to deprivation of the body. And then symbolizes degree of initiation. So more often than not, you don't really quite realize who they actually know. Like who actually knows who? Because once again, it's the more subtle hand gestures that only higher grades will be aware of. So which club are you in? That's just one of the key reasons why Buddhism is a part of Mystery of Babylon. It is, like I said, white magic, but in the higher levels you can get into a lot of dark stuff pretty quickly. Speaking of which, oh, let me disappear. This is the more dark side of the force of Buddhism, and that is Tibet and that is Tibetan Buddhism. Focusing on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, also known as a Bardo Thottle. In English, it generally means the liberation by hearing on the after death plane. Here is liberation by hearing on the after death plane. This is a rational esoteric manual expounding the cycle of karma and rebirth. In graphic detail, I might add. The main purpose of it is to be is to uh, instruct in rituals and incantations to help a dead initiate. So remember, you have to be a part of this society to help you know to dead initiate to to sooner achieve nir nirvana. So. And you have to do this with within the first, well, depending on the rituals and incantations, within the first few, preferably within the first few days. So it has to be, uh, of course, closer to the moment of death, the better, because the idea is to influence the, to influence the transmigration, so then when the person reincarnates, they are you are there by imparting wisdom, so to speak, to them, so then they come about as a more enlightened figure on the eight pole full path, have more awareness of the eight, of the four noble truths. The origin is that of the eighth century. Like I said, founded by founded by that of a secret society. This is where you get Lama, you know, Lamaism, a form of tantric Buddhism, 
takes it, it took root in in you know in Tibet through the royal family. That's what you're going to see soon is that Buddhism in general, especially among the Tibetan Buddhists, is a, is is a, is is established by the elites in league with the monks. And then the priesthood of lamas, also known as the superior ones, among their practices use of mandalas, which are circular cosmograms of the universe for occult worship and transcendental medication. So, remember, so within these societies, in one of these higher grades, that's when magic and sorcery, divination become much more of a thing. And then there's Shambhala, which is some of you may have heard of. It's the legendary kingdom of enlightened citizens with warrior monks of prime awareness and compassion. But remember, this is a this is an amoral society, so so to speak. So uh, Shambhala, if you actually explore the legends, it's shrouded in well. You don't know what's going to happen. Whoever visits, after all, it's supposed to be a secret. <laughs> it's all said and done. All right. The Dalai Lama. As some of you were already anticipating. Dalai Lama stems from tradition of living Buddhas. Among the first being the reincarnation, said to be the reincarnation of Karma Pakshi, leader of the Karma Kagyu school of Tibetan Buddhism in the 13th century. Currently, there are about 13 other lamas that share in this cycle of enlightened masters. So yes, so there's not just the Buddha, there's also what are known as the living Buddhas. Remember, there's, remember, because there's more than one, uh, you know, Buddha Vista, and that's, you know, one that has, one that has achieved enlightenment, but for us, for Sukhan Nirvana to return, and so you have these living Buddhas, it's just, it's just these generational, these are, these are, these are, you know, generational figures who will come back for this soul, for this soul purpose. So, so to speak. And the Karma Kagyu school is actually one of the largest schools because there's multiple factions, multiple schools of thought and practices, more or less denominations, if you will, in Buddhism. In fact, it's actually only this century that they're really in interacting with each other and networking and working together, really learning from one another, et cetera, et cetera. Because it's, so there is, because, because remember, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, remember, it's, it's esoteric. There's a lot of secrets to, like, you know, to, like, you know, to, like, to guard. But there's a number of reasons that this is changing this century. The first Dalai Lama was known as Gedun Drupa of the 15th century. And he was appointed, like most, during his childhood story slash legend slash history slash myth it's hard to tell with a lot of these individuals and as most it seems like about half or so ish it's hard to tell because well there's a lot of corruption in the system we'll get into that soon we're from we're from up just poor individuals usually just far off in the countryside and the valleys in the mountains the hills But that's the thing, since the 5th Dalai Lama, until the 20th century, with our current Dalai Lama, the ruling central government has to approve of the selected candidates. Now, technically it still applies now, but there's, there's a little bit of con confusion, and I'll explain that soon. So, ever since the 5th Dalai Lama, the central government, in this case, that would be the Ming Chinese for a time, and for a while, it was the nationalist and communist military up until 1950. So the Ming, the Qing, and then nationalist, the communist. Yeah, so there had to be, so the candidates had to be approved. The candidates, so after, remember, so after the Dalai Lama dies, they need to go find 
they reincarnate Dalai, Dalai, you know, Dalai Lama, and that can take months to years. And usually, he's, usually he's a child. And so, the, and so whenever they find candidates, the central government has to prove of those candidates. So there's a, and so part of the corruptive aspect of it was there was bribery, extortion, or just flat out blackmail involved. In which, as you can imagine, political uh, political fi figures or members of members of noble and royal families were selected to be living Buddhas. The Dalai Lama cannot confirm. But I wouldn't be surprised if it happened more than once. <laughs> Speaking of which, confirming selected these these you know these selected candidates involves divination. So you have so it involves you know divination. So intense med you know med you know med you know meditation, other private or mass ceremonial rituals, and a key one is that's usually done pretty much every single time, especially when when it comes to the Dalai Lama, is viewing. Lamo Lazo Lake. And the reason why Lamo Lazo Lake is so important f for this process is because it is where, since the fifth Dalai Lama, I believe, it's pretty sure it was the fifth Dalai Lama, could have been the third. Third and the fifth were pretty popular figures. Pretty sure it was, yeah, anyways. Third or fifth Dalai Lama encountered the goddess of the lake, who also happened to be one of the primary goddesses of the world, and this goddess blessed the Dalai Lama with being be, with being protector of the protector of the line of the reincarnations of of the you know, of the Dalai Lama, if not to a degree the other living Buddhas as, as well. So you so including viewing Lal, Lama Latsu Lake, and part of Many occult esoteric practices is divining with that of a clear reflective surface, water, glass, even metal. So meditating and really just trying to receive a vision, an image if you will, that will affirm or disavow what you are, you know, what you, what you're hoping to, you know, hoping to, uh, you know, you know, discover. So yeah, when it comes to, so yeah, so when it comes to uh, awareness without evaluation, this is this is one of the key exceptions. Currently, the fourteenth Dalai Lama, known as Tenzin Gyatso, was the you know has been the Dalai Lama since 1940. He was, he was, you know, he had, to, he had, he had to leave India in exile, still in exile, in Nepal, in you know, in Nepal, and he's, he's uh, currently 88 years old. And the reason why I say that there's complications as far as the next selection process is because he said years ago that when he came close to being 90, he may decide whether or not. After counsel with a number of Buddhist leaders, primarily, of course, of the Tibetan tradition on whether or not there should be the continuation of the Dalai Lama. So he's considering whether or not to be the last one. He is the uh, embodiment of Bodhisattva Avalokitesavara, which is a Let's well, reality more of a legendary mythic, more more of a legendary mythical figure, who is supposed to contain the compassion of all Buddhas. So Tenzin Gyatso is very big on compassion, but like I said, ultimately that compassion is what he's a he's he's seen as he 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 won the Nobel Peace Prize for his humanitarianism, and his peace, you know humanitarianism and his peace. He is a nationalist when it comes to uh, to uh, Tibet, as well as he also he also uh, sh he also did share his thoughts recently on wanting uh, people to remain in their homelands to rebuild 
So he's big. So he's fine with the Im immigration and refugees, but the big picture, they need to reside or return home to build up their own, to like to build up their own, uh, their own countries, their own people, and establish compassion there. But of course, remember that compassion is the cessation of life itself. So, the irony of ironies, right? Speaking of the self, let's turn ourselves over to Ecclesiastes two. 12 through 19, 2, 12 through 19, Ecclesiastes 2, 12 through 19 says, And I turned myself to behold wisdom, and madness and folly, for what can the man do that cometh after the, 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 you know, the king, even that which hath been already done? Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happened to them all. Then said I in my heart, As it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, That is also vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the, 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 the wise man as the fool? Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. But... Preacher does share at the end, chapter 12, verse 13, 14, acknowledging what? That there's much of life, that indeed, the, the Lord God does not shy away from the fact that life is vain, that life is uncertain, that life is confusing, that life seems rather abysmal without him. Without him. For he is the what? The way truth and the life so he's very direct about this reality but he always and I say lovingly merc mercifully reminds us instructs us implores us because that we don't have to live this way and we don't have to exist this way and we don't have to desire our self annihilation he said let him reside in us let for us his creatures to be our master to be our lord if not our heavenly father chapter 12 verse 13 14 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear god and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man for god shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil short life's vain apart from him but we're still responsible because we don't have to live in vanity and we know that in our heart of hearts so in regards to the self the difference between the, the word and the false light of the of the of the buddha what's the emphasis here when it comes to self well for Jesus Christ, it is self-denial, which is not living for fleshly desire or worldly gain for such ends, where nothing is greater than, than the Lord God. Remember, that's the first commandment. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Self-denial is not putting faith in the world. 
So yes, we love not the world. Our hope is not in the world. We don't expect the world to get better just because we would like it to because we think this is the best that we got. Far from it. But it is what it is. It is not an illusion. This is where we currently reside, and this is where those redeemed by the Lord shall live forever and ever. It'll be a new one, though. Keep that in mind. <laughs> and self-denial does not live in sin, but Christ. For to live is Christ. To die is gain. To live... Christ to die is gain, that's the thing. So for us, death is not death is not a wanton thing of okay, well let's here we go again. It's oh no. Death is now receiving the baptismal resurrection of wisdom himself, of the truth. Whereas for the Buddha, not self is what's to be attained. The not-self, bear in mind, the not-self is not sensation, perception, volition, and consciousness. The not-self is not sensation, perception, volition, and consciousness. The not-self is nothing impermanent, changing, so yes, even the f yes, so even yes, so remember your body too, no go, because you go from a child, go from an infant to a toddler to child, adolescent, young adult, older, older, geriatric, dead. Not separate from substance. So the not self is not separate from substance. Remember, as it says in Zen, the immediate realization that all is one. Hence, you can become literally anything in your, in your next reincarnated life. It doesn't matter. So in other words, there's no, and when, it's, and, the, and when it's all said and done, there's no more value between that of a gnat and a human being. We're all one. Human life is indeed, well, for the Buddhists, a vicious cycle. And the not-self does not avoid extinction. Does not avoid extinction. So that's a part of the whole, well, rationale, if you will. Because, because, because you know, remember, desire, to feel, to love, to hate, to be hungry. I mean, really, even to be hungry, to be thirsty. To see and be blind. No. That's not, you know, that's, you know, that's not, not you know, not the case. So self-denial is the recognition of that you are created, that you are loved, but also, but also, you must love in return. That's the thing about love. God loves us, yes, but that love necessitates love in return. That's, that's when love is actually complete. And you can't enjoy the benefits of love if you don't love back. And part of that love is what? The offering of the truth, the offering of life, the offering of a way to get from point A to point B and be joyous and content. Versus just, just doing it one more time, one more time, one more time. But if you don't love that back, you're not going to get it. Think of it that way. As for the, as for the Buddha, well, well, remember. He couldn't face poverty. He couldn't face aging. He couldn't face sickness, couldn't face death. 
For him, that made life all the more vain, because remember, it's all about the self. Well, what's the point? I can't fulfill anything I really, just truly, you know, truly don't desire. And, and it's just like in Ecclesiastes, it's all going to be for naught when it's all said and done. So, rather than surrender to the truth, the way the life outside of me, I'm going to look inward, and I'm just going to just shut down any sense of feeling, cessation, desire. Boom, problem solved. Just for the time being. Buddhism is a global stakeholder. Is the it made a formal introduction to the USA via the Parliament of World Religions in 1893, just like Hinduism. And since the 1970s, it has merged with psychology, now known as mindfulness. Ever since the 70s, 60s really, 50s, people would argue the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, but 70s, it was mainstream. Since the 70s, Buddhist meditation, thought, has been a primary element, believe it or not, primary element of psychology. Now, of course... Not as not as obvious, and because there's different schools of thought in, in in psychological circles. Nonetheless, Buddhism has touched every single one. Some more obviously than you know than others. And currently, one of the main main practices is known as mindfulness, where literally you just meditate for for those that are usually new initiates, so to speak. A short period of time but once again the goal isn't to evaluate your situation meaning that let's say okay how about this they do they did this at a called the mindfulness project at a school in San, in San Francisco all right let's see here your family's poor your parents are are are, are uh, divorced and one of them or both of them have a criminal record and you may also have a learning disability so rather than evaluate okay these are things I shouldn't do instead the goal is what not to be angry to be still so rather than so it's not mindfulness of how do I live rightly how do I know the truth how do I actually value, find the true value, which is that of which I feel thankful for, and thus thereby merciful when it comes to life itself. But no, no, just remember, it's the diminishing, if not cessation, of desire, of craving. So it's an amoral approach. Because eventually, what, the goal is that, you know, when you, when you get to... The actual, the actual flaws of Buddhism itself, the goal is to no longer exist. Anyways, the United Nations New York headquarters has been celebrating Vesak, sorry, it's Wesak, celebrating Wesak, it starts with, it's, it's spelled with a V, but it's actually pronounced with a W, with Wesak since 2000. Now, Wesak is essentially the, uh, there's been a, it's the it's it's no Wesak is the official celebration of the birth, life, and death. Birth, life, and death of of the Buddha of a of a you know you know Dartha. And there's been different variations of that before 1950, but it wasn't until 1950 that they decided as a, that Buddha as a, as a whole decided to consolidate it, and it's been an official holiday for the United Nations since 2000, the turn of the 21st century. Now, now the Belushi's Trust started in 1922, founded by esoterics such as Alice Bailey. Before that, they were known as the Lucifer Trust. They are currently still in the United, in the United Nations as one of the, their advisors. In fact, they have an office in Washington, D.C., not too far from the United Nations. 
not too far from the United Nations uh, office there and they now the thing about Lucius Trust is yes completely different set of spirituality it's new age it's new age uh, white white you know you know you know occultism white magic nonetheless you know nonetheless Lucius Trust their philosophy you would say you can be summarized into the fusion of Buddhism and Christianity, and I say Christianity loosely because I don't mean biblical Christianity, like you know, just the general themes and trappings of Christianity, especially Christ, but merged with also really a hollowed out Buddhism as well. So it's just milk, elementary milk, elementary Christianity and Buddhism, and then you just put it t t like you know, to like you know, together. And the Lucius Trust, you can find this on YouTube, celebrated. Westack, and there's in that video, in fact, the, in fact, actually, I'll get to that later, and they, where they, where they made a pretty clear explanation that Westack, not only is it the celebration of the birth, life, and death, no resurrection, just throwing that in there, of the, uh, of the, you know, of the Buddha, it is also, the purpose of it is also to unite in global consciousness, so if you celebrate West Act, the point is to meditate, preferably at the same time, to unite the consciousness of the globe. And why? Because the goal is, once again, to accelerate faster to unify consciousness, and thereby what? Nirvana. Self-violation. Self Inverted mercy killing. A humane self-extinction. Now, with that said, there are two major things which, of course, may, you know, are, pro are proving to be, and have long time been, and they're trying to address that, huge weaknesses when it comes to Buddhism's very existence. We'll get to that soon. But also, Roman Catholic ecumenism is very fond of Buddhism. If you look at uh, websites like catholicanswers.com, their approach to Buddhism is basically that it's apostate, Catholics shouldn't practice it. Unfortunately, that's not what the Roman Catholic hierarchy and higher educational institutions hold whatsoever, amongst other institutions as well, including a number of monasteries and Catholic retreat centers. In which uh, no, there's actually quite a quite a quite a grand friendliness between between uh, the Catholic hierarchy and Buddhist leadership. And so, in fact, uh, there's a mul in fact, there aren't that many Buddhist universities in the United States. That may change in due time, but there are plenty of blue of a Buddhist uh, a Buddhist uh, clubs, institutes, and organizations that are quite active influential amongst a number of colleges, both secular and especially amongst Roman Catholic circles. In 2013, you had the International Buddhist Confederation. I find that something, because 2013 is the year I, I graduated college. I'm noticing a lot of things happen in 2012 and 13. It's crazy how you're just, it's like you realize that just how part of history you, like, you really are. When it just hits so close to home, when you realize what's really going out on out in the world. So the International Buddhist Confederation is the first major attempt and successful. It's growing. In fact, they had the uh, in fact uh, this year, ten years later, twenty twenty three, they had the first World Buddhist Summit hosted in. India and guess who was there the Dalai Lama as well as surprise surprise I was surprised I was surprised the Prime Minister of India as well who is a pretty devout Hindu go figure so Prime Minister Modi actually gave actually gave a keynote speech 
at the first summit for the International Buddhist Confederation in his country, alongside the 88-year-old Dalai, you know, Dalai, no, sorry, Dalai Lama. A little dry and humid around these parts, so I'm just trying to stay hydrated, keep my tongue loose. And more recently, there was the international, the initiation of the International Buddhist Association of America in 2015, headquartered in Washington, D.C. And what is its goal? To preserve, protect, and promote Buddhism in the United States. Buddhism is gradually growing. They're having a hard time maintaining people attending the churches. Yes, there's churches and the temples. But there are a growing number of practitioners, most of whom tend to be older. Most of whom tend to be older. It's uh, once again, it's, once again, Buddhism requires a lot more focus and discipline, especially when you're literally, sh you know, shutting your brain off. So it tends to be for people, on average, late thirties and up. Notably above, no, notably above, you know, for those over 45. They have, like I said, they have an office in, they have, the, they have an office in D.C. Quite, and it's quite, a, it's a pretty active lobby group. In fact, they managed to celebrate WESAC in the White House in, in a room called the, called the Indian Treaty Room. And we've been celebrating WESAC's uh, in the White House since 2020. Yeah, that was right. It was the third annual, so that means it's 2021. So there you go. President Donald Trump uh, made uh, being a sodomite and, and, and Republican slash conservative popular. And well, you know, there you go. President Joseph Biden has invited... Eastern mysticism directly into the White House for Universal Global Consciousness Day over the Buddha. Members of Mystery Babylon people. Alright, speaking of which, there is the tradition of Maitreya. So, one of the, so the two key weaknesses for Buddhism is this. First off, because of its its view of human life, as you can imagine, people aren't exactly that heavily motivated in the long term. And there's also been a heavy, a hefty decrease as how much has contributed to the lower birth rates in certain, in, in, especially in Asian countries, is is debatable. But it's definitely not encouraging. It's also done. It's definitely not along with our modern, our modern ethos. Is not encouraging procreation. So there's been a reduction in numbers around the world, but in Western countries, particularly the United States, there is a steady increase. And there's also the, uh, and there's also the effect too that, um, well, it's 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 a part of Buddhism that it's going to end. In fact, it's supposed to end at some point. But for Buddhists, it's ending a little too quickly. Hence why they're linking arms to, together, watering down their traditions, and kowtowing into a great degree of compromise as they've done throughout the centuries to national governments, in this case, broadening out to that the international community at large. So, in order to stay relevant, to stay you know, pre you know, prevalent in the world, they are, they are behaving just like the American liberal and sadly a lot of the conservative churches as well, and serving Caesar, and, serve, you know, and serving the Sanhedrin, and, you know, and, you know, and serving uh, Nimrod, you know, helping build Babel in their own way. And part of that is Maitreya. 
So, Maitreya resides in the fourth heaven among the Bodhisattvas. And so, so oftentimes, you know, the Bodhisattvas are either, like, that's... You know, there's, 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 there's contention about the levels of heaven, but really, they're not, like, remember, they're, they're not in Nirvana. They still exist. If anything, they're just there briefly to meditate longer before returning to Earth to continue their instructions in hum inhumane self-annihilation through the Four Noble Truths and Eightfold Path, which takes several lifetimes to master. Anyways, so, and that's the thing, then the Maitreya is the one who, who will become the next Buddha when Buddhism goes extinct. So at some point, Buddhism is supposed to work so well that, well, yeah, it just doesn't exist anymore. And that will be around close to, around the end of the, well, anyways, that's a whole other part of the uh, part of the uh, lore. But anyways, he must enter to offset Mara. So remember, Mara, just say Mara. Only this. T well, here's the thing, though. Mara currently is 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 you know is one with good karma turned tempter. So Mara, remember, he wasn't evil. Still not evil. In fact, he actually has a lot of good karma. It's just that he's decided to become a tempter away from enlightenment, rather than towards. So he's a, so he's in essence a false, or pseudo bodhisattva. But remember, Mara is still really a part of the universe. Like he's part of the balance. He's a part of the system. It is what it is. And the Maitreya has manifested throughout history for brief periods to enlighten. So he, is, so he has come to Earth before, but he'll be here long term when Buddhism goes extinct, when it no longer exists. Of course, there's confusion whether that, that means mankind has ended or something happened with Buddhism to... Yeah, that's... Remember, remember, this is where you just got practices and these end tradition like ah, because it's really not meant to be known or, or, or understood. It's or understood. It is what it is. All right, and then as I think he's viewed by esoterics as a high ascended master of gnosis, if not the Christ. So in Buddhism, but mostly outside of Buddhism, unless you're a Buddhist who's heavily influenced, amongst other occult circles he is a high ascended master he's one of the as the gnostics would say one of the uh well not the archons because those are the bad guys but one of the I forgot what the other ones are but I forget what the other ones are but they're, but they're the quote quote the good ones more or less good ascended masters you know the you know the you know these are because remember in remember in new age is very similar to eastern tr tradition in that and mormonism Amongst other things, so let's say amongst so many other things, where beings, and I'm saying you, is the Allah Buddhists, they don't say human beings, they say beings. A lot of beings, sentient beings, will ascend to a higher, perfect state of enlightenment. They are sending masters; they'll become more godlike. Because that's one, because that's the thing. Like that's the thing. Like so, the Buddha never said directly to be worshipped like a god, but. He, in effect, like so many other living Buddhas and the like, other ascended masters, became more godlike. So hence, thereby, by inference, it's not really inappropriate for you, especially at a certain level of enlightenment, to worship an ascended master or more godlike being. So hence, Christ is also seen as one of the ascended masters. But we all know, no, because Christ is the creator, he is the word. The Alpha and the Omega. So beware of Antichrist. Beware of the false Christ. For Christ warned us for quite some time now, didn't he? So here are the secondary text sources. We have the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Translation. Translation and editor Evans Wentz. W.Y. W.Y. Evans Wentz. We have Buddhism by Richard A. Gard. That's his name, but not to spell it. 
Yeah, and you also have two works, the Dalai Lama's little book of wisdom, quotes from Tenzin, Gyatso, as well as Ethics for the New Millennium, also by Tenzin, Gyatso. That was an inter interesting read, Ethics for the New Millennium. It's definitely written in 1999, published in 1999, and, you, and yes, it's definitely it's the foretelling of really what happened to, to Buddhism on the world stage this century. So, Yatsu was uh, definitely ha you know, ahead of the curve as far as what he knew had to be done, so, you know, so to speak. And there's, and there's Peter Harvey's An Introduction to, Bo to Buddhism Teachings, History and Practices, 2nd Edition. There's also, as I mentioned before, D.T. Suzuki, Introduction of Zen Buddhism. And there's Paul Williams and Anthony Tribe, Buddhist Thought, A Complete Introduction to, to the Indian tra you know, Tradition. I read these just to make sure that I was not misunderstanding and utterly botching any of the primary sources. Pretty sure there was a little bit of misunderstanding here and there, but hey, these are these are these are scholars, if not practitioners themselves in their own right, and this will be validated by a number of video and audio sources as well. So, as far as I'm concerned, I try to do my due diligence. So in conclusion, Buddhism, humane self-annihilation. Let's look over to John chapter 16. Let's look at the words of our Lord. For life indeed is a vain thing apart from the Lord God, the way, the truth, and the life. We are responsible. We are not, here's the thing about Buddhism in a way, it kind of, Influences encourages victimhood. Just gonna say it. Whereas the truth is, we have to take responsibility for our sin and praise and thank the Lord for imparting His Spirit of righteousness into those who receive His forgiveness. For those who are born again. I've done a podcast on this. Born again and walk the narrow way engaging in spiritual warfare which just as much as spiritual warfare is not just a matter of engaging against the spirit of Satan and other devils but it's also engaging the spirits of the world as well as the corrupted spirit that we have prior prior our surrender to the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. So we're not looking inwardly, meditating on nothing, really, in the, you know, in the big picture, nothing. But we're calling out unto Him. Calling unto Him. In fact, John 16, starting with verse 27. Says, For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God I came forth from the Father and am come into the world again I leave the world and go to the Father his disciples said unto him lo now speak thou plainly and speakest no proverb now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee but this we believe that thou camest forth from God Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In me you may have peace. So remember he says before, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that ye may have, might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And why? Because remember, Christ 
knew I will be left alone. But it's not in vain, because the Father is with me. In tribulation, you may be alone. But it's not in vain, because I will be with you. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to, to, uh, to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Word from the beginning, from time before time. Came to the came to came to the earth. One same God, same man. Came to the earth in the flesh. And he, when he's left alone, to be unrighteously, to be illegally, and to be spitefully murdered, crucified on a cross. He is not alone because the Father is with him, so thus it is not vain. And because of his resurrection, he imparts to us that same covenant, that same relationship. So even in our tribulation, we are not alone. In fact, we don't seek the shadow of death. We don't seek our eventual dispersion. Snuffing out of our light, but no, instead we anticipate what? His perfection in us. With new bodies, new spirits, and regenerated minds that understand. In the meantime, my dear listeners, my brethren in Christ, do not look within. Do not look to the world. Do not entertain the mind-bending and mindless puzzles and questions of men. But know this. But know this. That he is the Lord God and we are not. And yet, he will hear us upon giving over our hearts. He will impart to us peace, not from our, not from within ourselves, but from our heavenly Father, from those who are born again in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I look forward to seeing all of you, my brethren, in the new heaven and the new earth. Until then, be at peace, live with joy, and endure the tribulation just the same as he has endured and overcome this world, and looks forward to life everlasting and abundant. This is Christian M.C. Fulmer. Signing out.